Well, we'll call it. We'll call the meeting to order. And uh, this is the February Ask Your Doctor, and I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Sam Passar, who is our Carlsbad by the Sea podiatrist, who will give us a little talk. And I think his title is absolutely marvelous. Agony of the feet. <laughs> we all want to take our shoes off? Yeah. <laughs> After. <laughs> My name is uh, Benjamin Pesa, and uh, as I was introduced, is it okay or should I? Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Up, up. Uh, up more. Good. Okay. Um, the talk of the day is the agony of the feet. Uh, most of most people take it for granted like foot pain at the end of the day is a normal thing. You've been on your feet all day, they should hurt you. It's not supposed to be like that. Your feet are supposed to carry you, do their work, and uh, at the end of the day, they should be normal. Uh, look at it this way. If you weigh 150 pounds, if you can carry this 150 pounds in your hand, you cannot carry it more than a few minutes. Your body is 150 pounds and your both feet are carrying you all day and without getting that fatigue which you get in your hand. It's a balancing mechanism that the feet are doing. Uh, the weight of the body, I'll draw some picture. That's the head, shoulder, and feet. And feet. 150 pounds, they come here and they divide it into two. So each foot takes 75 pounds. And then it comes to the feet. The weight is supposed to be distributed strictly along the axis of the second toe. So if you have five toes here, the weight to be exactly balanced, the weight has to come up to the second toe this way. This way the pressure is distributed evenly and you don't feel it. That's how the mechanic of the foot is to distribute the weight. Most people, the majority of the problem which happens with aching feet and all that is that this axis comes this way or a little bit that way, create all the problem. If you take a hundred pound log and if you carry it like that, it's too heavy. If you carry it from the middle, you don't feel the weight of it because it's just balancing it. The weight of it is no more like 100 pounds, but you can carry it much easier. If, the same thing with the feet. The way they are constructed is to take off the pressure and start to propel and walk. Uh, do you know how many miles a person can do in a lifetime? A normal person? Usually calculated about 65,000 miles in a lifetime. 65,000 miles. So about two and a half times around the globe. And uh, they are supposed to last you that long. What usually, most of the majority of the problem uh, leading to aching feet is mechanical problem. Uh, weight and distribute people roll in, they call them, they roll in when they walk or they have uh, um, abnormal structure of the foot. Some bones are longer, some bones are lower, some bones are different. So that causes a lot of kind of uneven distribution of the balance. I, we call it unbalanced feet, and these feet are the ones which need to be balanced. If it's detected early, it can prevent a lot, a lot of things in adulthood. Uh, I see kids, three, four, five years old, and their parents take them to Disneyland, and they hate Disneyland. Can you imagine a boy, five, six years old, hate Disneyland? Why? Flat feet. They cannot walk, they walk at that type. So they sit on the side to walk and just... Uh, this type of people can be detected early and can be treated and avoid many, many problems. I uh, brought with me here a skeleton. Do you know how many bones in the feet? Hundreds. 
It is before I begin to <laughs> circulate. <laughs> there is about 20, there is 26 bones in the feet. And uh, they formed a longitudinal arc, which is this arc, and they formed also a lateral arc, which is this arc, and the transverse arc, which is this arc. These three arcs work together to balance the feet and take all the pressure from the weight of the body. So we have a foot which is like this, and the weight comes down here and straight down this way to be optimally uh, perfect balanced foot. Sometimes if the balance is off and the weight is going this way, what will happen is that big dog trunk start to drift. And as a drift, they form a bunion. A bunion is an accumulation of bone on the as on the side of the big toe. And once it starts, it will keep escalating downward. It doesn't wrap itself by itself. And when it goes like that, the second toe starts to curl up above it and form hammer toe. A hammer toe also can be associated without problem with the big toe is because if you look at your thumb or finger, you see these muscles running here, this tendon, there is another set of tendon underneath. It pulls them back and forth so the finger or the toe can flex. This happens in the hand because the way, uh, there is no hand at all in the hand because the pressure going this way and underneath is even. But if you bring this ligament to the side, instead of going straight like that to the side and the foot collapse, this toe starts to curl and you're forming hammer toe. All these conditions lead to irritation, um, arthritis, and so on. Also, it brings calluses on the bottom of the feet and corn on the top of the toes. And uh, sometimes if you protect your foot from the very beginning, prevent or balance your foot, it eliminates a lot of this stuff. So, uh, heredity plays a big role. Parents who have flat feet and problems like that, children inherit it. And the earlier you teach them, the more you are sure that they will not get any of that, uh, uh, of these problems. Some of these problems uh, are corrected very easily early in life. Some of them, they are what we call rigid problems and they need some surgical correction. Okay. But uh, in general, when the kids are young and uh, bone flexible and everything, you can avoid a lot of this problem. Uh, <clears throat> next uh, topic I would like to talk is uh, uh, problem associated with uh, not uh, directly uh, pressure or balancing of the feet, problem associated with metabolic and physical condition. Uh, the feet are part of the body, they suffer anything the body suffers with. People have diabetes, uh, it affects every cell in the body, it affects also the feet. So diabetes has a, a general condition, affects the feet, and it shows itself more worse in the feet than any part of the body because the feet are the further away from the blood, as the blood circulates and go further and further away, the blood vessels get narrower and narrower and narrower. And not only that, it's harder to bring the blood back up. Uh, as it travels that long, it's harder to bring it up. And uh, narrowing the artery can make it even worse. So uh, there is less blood going, and also the blood coming out is less. So big, big problem. This affects not only the growth or the recovery, or if you have surgery or anything like that, or the repair. It's after injury, it affects everything in the feet, your sensation, uh, your, uh, the nerves get damaged because of two things, uh, high level of glucose due to diabetes, and also the damage due to lack of circulation to the nerve. And uh, one of the conditions which is very, very common with diabetic patients is neuropathy. Uh, people who have neuropathy they don't have any feeling. They can have very bad feeling, irritation and pain and uh, burning sensation, 
or they can have no feeling at all. And they feel like uh, their feet is swollen, and uh, they cannot feel, there is no feedback. When you walk, you put your feet down, there is no feedback where your foot is. And uh, lack of sensation in the feet also predisposed to wound. Any small irritation, the body doesn't react to it, so any small wound can be a really disastrous. So that's why they ask people who have neuropathy, inspect your feet, visually inspect your feet, because they have no feeling. I have a patient who takes insulin and he throws the tip of the needle on the floor, and it happens that he has his shoes and every time he breaks the needle, the needle falls inside his shoes. And he puts his shoes on and once uh, he gets infected, I took x-ray of his feet, I found 21 needles inside oh, his foot. 21, and some of them travel very deep inside. And mm -hmm. that the 21st one was an infection, superficial infection, and uh, uh, we took an x-ray, 21 needles have gone to them inside his foot. Did it help when you, when you took him out? Uh, no, we, we, he, had, he lost his foot. He, he, he was very badly diabetic and uh, it ended up with gangrene and... Uh, oh dear, yeah. oh dear. Uh, that's a sad story of a uh, thing like that. But uh, uh, that's lack of sensation in the feet. Sometimes neuropathy is not only due to diabetes. There is uh, a condition called familial neuropathy. People have a family history of neuropathy. They can have it in their hand and their feet, and uh, some, uh, some is unknown why. But some are, the reason for it is people who have uh, anemia and uh, uh, other condition can cause neuropathy, which once you know what the cause, you can treat it. But sometimes there is what you call the familial heredity neuropathy, which there is no reason for it. Uh, those who have this type of neuropathy, the newest medication which is given, uh, I think B12, B12 is the only thing which helps uh, reduce uh, the incidence and the pain of uh, the neuropathy. Plus there is other new, newer medication for the neuropathy, but it doesn't treat it. There is newer tests to be done. Uh, we take a piece of skin, analyze it under the microscope, under certain skin, and see how many nerve fibers are there. And according to how many nerve fibers we can tell uh, the condition of the neuropathy. And if we put them on some medication, later on we'll see if there is any regrowth of this nerve, then it's, uh, uh, it shows. So we have some tests available to do some tests on the neuropathy, but uh, it all depends on how, uh, how to control the diabetes, how to control the anemia, and all that condition. Um, and other condition with the foot, nail, nail problems. Uh, most of us probably have in their lifetime an ingrotto nail or uh, fungus on the nail. Uh, nails, uh, when they are ingrown, is one of the two things. Either you cut them wrong and they start to dig in, or the flesh is higher than the edge of the nail. So as the nail grows, it hits right in there. Sometimes trauma to the nails deform the nail and start to go in grow. So it's a, a condition which you know how to cut your toenail, uh, take care of it as early as possible because sometimes when you cut the nail uh, at an angle, let's see if this is a cut the nail like this and they cut these corners. So what happens is this corner as it grows, it grows down in the flesh, so they go a little bit more. And next time this side will start to grow in, they cut more. And they keep cutting more and every time that edge here, instead of being all the way up here, it's way down here, this part. And when this part starts to grow, it's, it's, you cannot reach it and cut it out. So the best thing is to have this area clear and cut the nail straight across and leave this corner without clipping them. This is the best way of doing it. <laughs>
Yeah, so this is the, uh, the best way to take care of the ingrotone here before it gets all the way down here. Um, the other condition which affects the nail is fungus. Fungus. Very common. And uh, it used to be uh, very, dis it doesn't cause really hard except it's very disfiguring and smells very bad. Mm. Uh, it smells like rotten, rotten wood. And, uh, but it doesn't spread into the system. It causes local damage, they look ugly, perhaps it comes sometimes you lose the nail. And sometimes it causes the fungus irritates the skin around it, so you see all redness around the toe when it's spread a little bit around it. It's a fungus which can affect also the skin. People have fungus on their nail, also they have athlete feet. Very common athlete feet, you will see that. Uh, feet is uh, red, swollen, itchy, and small dust to denote the activity of the fungus on them. And sometimes it remain dormant, and sometimes it comes back. Fungus affect feet because the germ get introduced inside, underneath the nail, and spread deeper inside. Uh, you can get also another type of fungus which start on the top of the nail, it's usually color white, you will see the nail is turning white, flaky on the top, and that fungus start to creep in and go down and affect the nail, the nail bed and go from one nail to the other. And they found out that people have fungus is heredity also. This type of fungus loves certain type of skin. You can have a person who has that, this fungus has affinity for their skin, let him be completely away from any showers or anything, and he can get it. And you can get one person who is resistant to that uh, organism. You soak his foot in a pool of fungus, he will not get it. Uh, it's, some skin has affinity to that fungus more than other people. That's why it's a heredity. You see it in families. Uh, that, uh, oh, I took, a, I, I used the shower, my family used the shower, and that's how usually that you see. Treatment for fungus nail. Fungus nail can be, in the beginning, can be treated very easy. Use a brush. A brush for the nail, when you shower your base, brush the nail, clear it up in the beginning. Uh, there is some medication, it came up at the time, there is medication, you can take it by mouth for, six, for three months, and it runs your liver, and it works only up to here. Because it's taken internally, so it works up halfway through the nail. And that's three months. You cannot take that medicine anymore. The fungus is still here. Once you stop the medicine, you go back. So you affected your liver, you affected uh, your pocket, and you still have the fungus. The new medicine came up uh, about two, three years ago, derived from urea. Urea. You know the old say, if you have a wound or a pee on it, it's, it works. Urea, 40% urea, it's a synthetic one, not the... <laughs> it's just it's applied on the nail and it works really good. It, it softens up the nail. The nail gets very mushy and it penetrates through the nail and disinfects the nail from that fungus. And within a few months you see that nail nice and clear. What's the name of it? Uh, it's 40 percent urea gel. There is cream and lotion, and there is cream and ointment, but the gel works better because you paint it on the nail. That medicine three years ago was about thirty dollars, the brand name. And nowadays it's about <coughs> seventy-five dollars and generic. I don't know <laughs> <laughs> what happened to the. If you have fungus and you can't really see it, should you be able to feel it? Should it hurt? Well, you, no, you can see it. You can see it. The nail gets very sick. But does it ever hurt? It no, hurt? that's why I said it's a, it's a condition which doesn't kill you or that. It's just the smell and the disfiguration. It looks ugly. So, mm -hmm. um, oh. yeah. So, so that's why people look for treatment for it, especially women nowadays, and they need to have nail polish, they need to have them. Uh, we'll talk about nail polish later on. <laughs> uh, 
they wanted to have it treated. They go on the beach and they need their feet to be looked nice and they need to have it treated. Uh, we are talking about the medicine, uh, the urea. Uh, it's a prescription, so you need a prescription to have it. And nowadays there is a laser treatment. And uh, uh, the cost of laser treatment is really outrageous because you're spending about an average of $800 to have laser treatment on your nail, but you still have to continue cleaning them up and all that. If you do only the cleaning, filing and cleaning up by itself, it will take six months to get rid of this uh, fungus. So if uh, you can have the laser treatment, if you don't take care of it, it will come back again. So you can save yourself the $800 and use a brush and use a little bit of that uh, uh, urea and it will get rid of the nail. Unless the nail has been damaged, trauma. If a nail has been traumatized, uh, the nail grows from three areas in the body. And if you look at uh, the finger, I will uh, draw the finger sideways like that. And the nail is like this here. The nail grow from three areas. One is here, this like this here. One is from the bottom, and the nail itself. All these three layers fuse together and form the nail. This part of the is called the matrix where the nail grow from. And the, the last layer is the layer attached to the nail bed. So this layer here is attached to the nail. You cannot pull your nail. This is the layer which is coming from that part here, the bottom part. <coughs> People who traumatize the nail damage this layer because you got, you're going to get a blood clot underneath and the nail is damaged. The nail will not stick anymore because part of the layer has been damaged. Sometimes if the damage is uh, minor, it will clear up and go away. If the damage is bad, it affects the bone, and then there is a piece of bone growing up and pushing the nail up. You can see, on, especially on the big toe, uh, which is the most injured toe nail, you will see a hump like that. It's because it has been damaged. Uh, we call it the frozen chicken syndrome. The lady opened up the refrigerator or the freezer, and here's the chicken for and her big toe. So the toe end up injured, and uh, uh, sometimes it's a blessing for a bad nail because many times I had patients injuring a very bad fungus nail, and the new nail comes up really perfect. Hmm. But in, in the majority of cases, uh, injury lead to fungus infection on the nail and so forth. This type of nail, no matter what you do, the nail will be bad. It can be better from uh, clear from fungus, but it will still be disfigured uh, in the way it grows. Grow maybe very thick, it might go greenish in color, and it can be still loose on the bottom. And these are uh, uh, a problem. Uh, the, way, the thickness of the nail makes it really hard for the patient to cut them and all that, so we end up sometimes removing the whole nail or uh, filing it down regularly. They come to just file the nail. We file it perfectly all the way. There is other condition associated with the feet, but uh, most of it also related to uh, mechanical problem like plantar fasciitis or and heel spur. People, very common condition is especially around January, February, March when the weather is is the cold of the weather and all that, and uh, you develop irritation at uh, the heel and forming a heel spur. And uh, let me, I just wanted to comment on heel spur. Uh, let me draw it here. If this is a foot, that's the heel, this is a foot. Heel spur. A lot of people think, because of the pain, is really sharp pain right in here, think that a heel spur is a heel spur like that. So what they do is they buy this donut, put them in the shoes, and it doesn't help them. So they come and see help. Uh, when I explain to them, this heel spur is a secondary, 
inflammation due to a condition called plantar fasciitis. If you look at your foot, on the bottom, there is a big ligament. It's called the plantar fascia, which is uh, like the string of the ball, exactly like the string of the ball here. It's called plantar fascia. This plantar fascia sometimes gets irritated and it pulls on the bone. It pulls on the bone where it is attached. This is the heel. And that spot here, the plantar fascia is attached to it. Like that. So all the pole is on that corner. It irritated, it gets inflamed, and with time it forms a heel spur. The correction of the heel spur, it used to be to go in and file it down, and in the process of filing down, you're gonna release that big ball, uh, the string of the ball, and you end up messing up your foot. The best thing for it is to support that ball so there is no more pull on that spur. And once there is no more, spur, uh, no more pull, it heals. So you don't need surgery, you don't need anything. Sometimes you need injection to calm down the inflammation, but the treatment for it is to wear support. And uh, this will bring us to the next element of orthotics. Uh, you all seen all these ads on uh, TV about orthotics and uh, this machine, Dr. Scholl machine, you step up on it and okay, uh, you, have, you have pronation and all that. They don't do any harm, uh, these devices, they don't do any harm. But the way it, it used to uh, tell you you need something is really uh, not under uh, evaluation. You can go buy a reading glasses for $20 and go have evaluation on your feet and have, uh, no sorry, evaluation on your eyes and go end up with a $200 glasses. So that's the difference. Uh, when you step, I, I was watching one guy, uh, even in the air, they step on the machine here and tell you, you have pronation. Uh, what does it mean? That means you're rolling in. The word pronation is an action. You cannot tell pronation unless you walk. So how can a machine like that diagnose you have pronation if you haven't checked the patient walking? Because you can step up like this, you can step up like that, you can step up like this, and it changes the position of the foot. So pronation is, you see it on the patient. It's not just standing up and recording. When you need a support, like I said, the one you buy from the stores, they do not do any harm. And maybe they do good. People, these are made for people who don't have problem. Yes. But if you don't have problem, why you need them? <laughs> uh, people who need, have problem need really a custom, custom made one. Uh, these are custom made orthotics. It entitled evaluation, see how much your foot is turned in, how much your foot is turned out. <laughs> Even if a person has the both feet on the same person are different. Some some people have the whole foot attached to the leg straight like that. Some people have the foot attached a little bit at an angle. Some people have it the other way. Some people have the front part of the foot like this. Some people have the front part of the foot like that. And the combination of all of these. So Having an evaluation, a more done of the feet, and then a custom or such is from the evaluation. Because there is many, if you look at this, this is not a heel lift. This is a control to turn the device how many degrees we want it to turn it in. And none of this stuff is available over the counter or by mail or any of the stores which they do these uh, uh, devices. One other thing I wanted to talk with you about is shoes. Shoes are very important because if they are not well made or well supported, they are going to ruin your foot. 
when you go look for a shoes, I will give you just a general idea about it. Because even if I recommend one brand, they have so many different styles. Some of them are good, some of them are bad. So when you look for a shoe, counter, sturdy counter. A shoe which has a floppy counter will not hold you good inside the shoe. When you bend the shoes, it should bend only near the toe, like this. And if you twist the shoe, it should twist a little bit, not very much. So when you go buy a shoe, look for this criteria. And uh, uh, why it should bend only near the toe, not in the middle? If it bends in the middle, so it's a very floppy shoe. If it uh, also it will twist very much way if it bends in, in the middle. So these two things are correlated. Uh, people think of uh, a soft shoe. They, they think that when the shoe is soft, it's, uh, it's better for them. Uh, this device is as hard as anything. People run with these. So can you imagine the softness of the shoes inside? is not a prime thing, oh, the feet feel soft on your feet. It's not uh, for everybody. You need some covers, you have to make it a uh, cushion, but you need the sole to be sturdy. Especially with some people who have problem, uh, those who have uh, too much motion in their feet, floppy feet, we call them floppy feet. They are very movable, you cannot control it unless you wear an orthotics to hold it really to be able to propel. You cannot propel from bones which are very floppy. The bones have to be sturdy together so you can propel. And uh, uh, this is a, a shoe will hold this bone much better than a floppy shoe or a soft shoe and so forth. I can, if I, I can have time for question and answer or uh, you want me to talk more? <laughs> Yes. Uh, could you say something about Morton's neuroma? Morton's neuroma, okay. The nerve which supplies the feet are coming up and in between each area here there is a fusion of one nerve from this side, one nerve from that side and they open up and they supply nerve to the toes. In some condition this nerve, while it gets together, is a little bit enlarged and it falls right in the most common place is this space, the mm -hmm. third interspace. Sometimes you see them also on the first, but they can occur any time, but that's the most common thing here, a nerve. And when you walk, this nerve gets like that and keep hitting it, get irritated, and the more irritated it swells up, get bigger, and the bigger it gets, the more bending in it. And it causes severe pain. Severe pain in that area and also radiating to the toes. Women who have predisposition to that, they walk for a while and then they have to sit down and massage their feet. Very common. You see the person sitting down and massaging from the pain of that neuroma. And uh, uh, it depends on what is, uh, we know what causing it is rubbing in that. If there is too much motion, very easy to treat it by putting a metatarsal pad, spreading these bones away. There is pad, you put them here. It spreads the bone away, prevents the friction, get rid of the problem. What's the relation of high heels to that problem? Uh, you can wear high heel if they are very supportive. There is some high heel which are not very floppy, mm -hmm. uh, and it support all your weight is really under the arch. So high, you can wear high heel. But there is so many uh, uh, different uh, causes of the neuroma. Some, uh, sometimes uh, the bones are positioned a little bit in a different position. Sometimes one bone is longer than the other. So you have to, in consideration, high by itself is a factor, but not the main factor. In fact, some, uh, some good high heel, they reduce the pain of neuroma because you are mostly on your arch, not on your chip toe. Mm -hmm. So uh, people uh, get sometimes relief because the weight is not on the, on the ball of the foot when they are on high heel, but the weight is good 
well built high heel. They have the pressure is here, not on the toes. And some people uh, feel relief from that pain if it's the shoe is good. If the shoe is bad, it will make it worse because you are right on these bones and attacking it. Also, high heel, the problem with high heel is you are squeezing all the front part of the foot. And this by itself is, is a traumatic factor on the neuroma. So if it's a, if it's a good shoes, and, but still narrow front, it will do the same problem. So it, treating is by a metatarsal pad to spread this bone away from each other. Yeah, I tried and that in the metat metatarsal, metatarsal arch, and it just, you know, it's continued with time, and as the foot weakens, I find that it causes twisting, tor it torques the knee, and causes the knee to fail. Well, uh, the, the, uh, I don't recommend metatarsal arch by itself. I recommend a whole device with a metatarsal arch in it. The reason is it splints the foot. Mm -hmm. It prevents it from splaying and moving too much. Yeah. This device, is when you wear them, it position your foot like that or locked in to be rigid. Mm -hmm. uh, why people, uh, they, they say the arch collapse, I will give you just a general description about the motion of the foot. When we walk, can everybody see here? These are the steps we take when we walk. We go like this, what we call pronate, and when the foot is pronated, it's very floppy, very floppy. And then we supinate, and then when you supinate or go in this motion, the foot turns into a very rigid structure. Very strong. Everything is locked in. And then you can propel. Mm. But if you don't have enough supination, or if you pronate too much that you don't even get to supination, your foot will be floppy and all that. So no matter what, if you put metatarsal arch here, the foot is floppy. Mm. So if you put an arc, this foot will not be floppy, will not be moving too much. Mm. So that's why I don't recommend metatarsal tarsal arch by itself. I have to have the whole thing, it will do the job. Mm -hmm. and not only that, uh, it doesn't affect, your neuroma doesn't affect maybe the way you walk, you start walking uneven, so it shifted and then caused damage to the knee. But a device like this, which has how much degree of tilt and all that, mm -hmm. give you exactly the balancing effect your foot will be more locked in, more sturdy to propel, and takes care of the problem. Thank you. So, anybody has any other question? Thank you. Not yet. <laughs> I have questions. <laughs> yes. You talk about um, corns or pressures. Okay. Corn occurs on the top of the foot, on the toes mostly. Calluses occur on the bottom of the foot. They are the same thing, friction, extra friction. Most corn occurs because the, shoe, the toes, even a little bit of deviation. If the toe is like this, trapped on the top of the shoes, form a corn. Sometimes corn occurs between the toe. What happened is some of these bones, if you look at uh, the skeleton, you will see the end of each bone is flared up. And sometimes this flare up and the one next to it is not long. It's not lodged right in between like that, but at an, uh, exactly opposing each other. So bone spur from here, bone spur from there, rubbing each other form what you call a soft core, which is between the toes. And it can occur any space here, any space. Worse of them is the one which occurs on between the small toe and the... And this is due sometimes a short bone here, brings everything down and these bones hit together. The, uh, the cause of uh, core friction. There is nothing else. There is no core developed without friction. So if, uh, if the corn is developed because of the shoe, 
If you get wider shoes, get rid of the problem. Sometimes uh, tight uh, nylons or tight socks can squeeze the toe and push it against the shoes and cause corn. Uh, treatment of corn is very easy. Uh, just take it like that. This will take friction and prevent your skin from getting the friction, corn will go away. The corn on the fifth toe, if you twist the toe like that and take it, all the friction will be on the tape and the corn will go away. And uh, I used to do a lot of surgery on them, take them out, take a small piece of bone, get rid of the corn, and I found out just saving a lot of money, a lot of hassle, just put some tape. <laughs> Some tip around it is that's kind of the problem. Yes. I've been growing toenails. Let's say you remove them, then after a while you go in and operate and cut them out. How come they return again? Okay, there is two ways of removing the ingrown toenail. If the flesh along the toenail is high, when you remove the corner of the nail, you should remove that matrix. This is what makes the nail grow. If you don't remove the matrix, just remove the nail and it will grow back, it, the nail will grow back. But if you remove the matrix, it will not grow back, if it's done correctly. Well, the reason I had it done, it keeps growing back. That means I didn't kill the matrix, I didn't kill the root. Whenever, uh, if it happens in the beginning, I don't recommend removing the root unless really the flesh is too high. And so no matter how many times you remove the nail, uh, when we remove the nail, we remove it like this, part of it like that. Yeah. And then it will grow back. Hopefully it will grow back nice. But with some people, yes, some people it will dig in again. And then you will know that <coughs> the flesh is too high the flesh is covering the nail, so no matter what you do, the nail will guide itself inside the flesh, then it's better to remove the matrix. When you do it, you remove the matrix, kill it with some chemical, so that corner, you won't have that corner anymore. Or remove a piece of the flesh, if the flesh is too high, reduce it during surgery, and you will have an open groove, so the nail will, will not grow back again. So brushing helps take away the fungus on your nail, you won't get nails. It's like your teeth, you know, tartar develop on your teeth. You, you need to keep brushing them. Get a brush, keep it in the shower. Whenever you shower, please use a brush, it will feel very good. Is it wire brush? No wire brush. <laughs> <laughs> there, is, there is some brushes, I mean, uh, you find them at, uh, they look like, if you go to a store to buy uh, the brush to clean potato skin with, something similar to that. But they sell them at beauty shop and stuff like that. It's nail brush, they're called nail brush. They're about that size. Yeah. And with a small handle, just brush all your nail with it. Well, you made me a pair of those inserts on yes. the shoes. Yes. And I liked them, and if I'm having a little problem with it, and I went to a guy to buy some new shoes, and he said, you got the wrong size shoe. I had a wide tennis shoe instead of a D as a dog. Yeah. And I got the right size and they worked perfect. Yeah, sometimes if you, if you, uh, you can have the best device in the world and if you don't put it in a good shoe or a fitted shoe, it will be wasted. It won't do any good because if you put it in a very flabby shoe, the shoes will take it with it. You need to have this stabilized inside the shoe which fits you good. So I would like to conclude, uh, I mentioned in the beginning that uh, the agony of the feet, and I will add to it, the agony of the feet has been defeated. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay, very good.